hello class for this presentation we'll be part, talking about parkinson's disease what is parkinson's disease parkinson's disease is a progressive nervous system disorder that affects the movement most people develop p at about age 60. approximately 60,000 americans are diagnosed with parkinson's disease each year men are 50 percent more likely to have parkinson's disease than women Parkinson's disease occurs when nerve cells in the basal ganglia become impaired or died off. The basal ganglia is in the area of the brain that controls the movement. The nerve cells or neurons produce dopamine, then the neurons die off or become impaired and produce less dopamine. This is the reason why the body will have movement problems. Scientists still do not know what causes the cells to produce dopamine to die. On the next screen, you can see a healthy brain to the left where the basal ganglia is active. And then when you see it to your right, Parkinson's disease after symptoms, you can see the basal ganglia receptors not producing any dopamine. On the next slide, this chart, you can see the Parkinson's prevalence in the United States. 1.2 million people in the US will have PD by 2030. 930,000 people in the U.S. have PD last 2020. Early symptoms of Parkinson's disease, tremors, small handwriting, muscle stiffness, slowing of movement, lack of facial expression, soft or low voice, stoop posture, decreased arm swing. PD symptoms, tremors, Trembling in hands, arms, legs, and jaw. Stiffness of the head, lips, and trunk. Slowness of movement, impaired balance, and coordination, sometimes leading to falls, depression, and emotional changes. Difficulty swallowing, chewing, and speaking. Urinary problems, constipation, skin problems, sleep problems, writing changes. And then the stages of Parkinson's disease. At stage one, they develop mild symptoms, but able to go about day-to-day -day life. Stage two, symptoms such as tremors and stiffness begin to worsen, may develop poor posture or have trouble walking. At stage three, movement begins to slow down, loss of balance. At stage four, symptoms are severe and cause significant issues with day-to-day -day living, unable to live alone will need care. At stage five, walking or standing may be impossible at this point. People at this stage are often confined in a wheelchair or bed. At this time, there is no cure for Parkinson's disease, and the research on pharmacological intervention has been only able to come up with drugs that can offer benefits in terms of improvements to motor functions like tremors and other movement-related effects. However, all of the drugs come with extremely problematic side effects. The primary medications used are in the levodopa family. It delivers the dopamine into the brain that Parkinson's patients are missing. There is a pill, an inhaled version, which is almost like a rescue inhaler and an infusion, which may help once the pill stop working, but needs to be administered through a feeding tube. The problem with these drugs is that most of them will stop working eventually. Next, there are the dopamine agonists. These might offer more consistent relief if they work at all. And then there's the MAOB inhibitors. These are often added to levodopa to help prevent it from wearing off. Then there are the COMT inhibitors. These also act to help prolong, prolong the effectiveness of levodopa. And then the anticholinergics, which can work specifically on the tremors. And then am amantadine, which can be prescribed in the early stages of Parkinson's disease just to control tremors, or it can be added to the levodopa to help control the dyskinesia, which are the large muscle movements that can be induced by levodopa. The side effects of all of these drugs are dangerous, uncomfortable, and scary for a lot of patients. Levodopa can cause nausea, lightheadedness, and dyskinesia. 
Dopamine agonists can cause hallucinations, sleepiness, and compulsive behaviors like hypersexuality, gambling, and overeating. The MAOB inhibitors can cause headaches, nausea, or insomnia. And those actually should not be used with antidepressants or narcotics because then they can have potentially serious side effects like death. The COMT inhibitors have an increased risk of the involuntary movements like dyskinesia. And they also have side effects that include diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting, and can also cause severe liver damage. Anticholinergics can cause impaired memory, confusion, hallucinations, constipation, dry mouth, and impaired urinary, urination. And amantadine may cause a purple modeling of the skin, ankle swelling, or hallucinations. As you can see, none of these side effects would be desired. Now we have this video that we'd like you to watch. I'll take a lot of prescription medication this morning. And this is how it helps. And it doesn't. I've since investigated and purchased some medical cannabis oil. I'm going to have some in a minute. And I'd like you to see how it helps me. This is my oil, cannabis oil. It doesn't taste very nice, so I'm going to put it in a biscuit. That's probably a little bit too much, but I'm bad today. And I'm just going to spread it on the biscuit like that. You could do this with anything, but I prefer the sweet biscuit. All right, we'll come back in about 10 or 15 minutes and see what happens. It's been 20 minutes since I've had that butter in the biscuit, and I feel wonderful. No shakes, no nothing. And you tell me, why can't this be legalised? It helps so many people. I have, it's changed my life. I have such quality of life now. And I'm forever grateful to the man who organised this for me. So as you can see, there were amazing effects from when Jill used uh, some sort of cannabis product, which I'm not, we're not clear about which it was, if it was mostly CBD or THC and CBD. However, she had amazing results. When looking at all of the research, it seemed to me that CBD looked like the most encouraging option. From one study, it said that CBD did not alter cardiovascular parameters, body temperature, psychomotor, and psychological function, um, functions, as well as it did not induce catalepsy like a Delta-9 THC did. The first rat study that was done found that CBD was highly neuroprotective and that it used its antioxidant mechanisms that helped to support and protect neurons from continued progressive degeneration. And what was interesting is since this was one of the first studies, they did actually find that there should be more um, of a look into the activation of the CB2 receptors because it seemed that they might have the most potential. I found a lot of other studies that supported the use of CBD the, um, another rat study found that it also had promising neuroprotective properties and that there were no, no side effects as well as it had low toxicity. Another one actually found that CBD was helpful in the treatment of psychosis and Parkinson's disease. And this was pretty amazing. So this was actually done on uh, actual patients, six outpatients that had um, Parkinson's disease, as well as psychotic episodes for at least three months. They received CBD with a dose that initially started at 150 milligrams a day for four weeks. 
in addition to taking their pharmaceutical regime, which I think is important to note because I think it would be irresponsible to take them off of that, which most people would agree. But the data did show that they had a significant reduction in their psychotic symptoms. And they had, uh, there's a score a test that you take a rating scale that they took and it showed significant improvement. And there were actually no side effects that were observed in that. Another one, another study, study also found um, that CBG was also extremely neuroprotective. Another study that found um, specifically was done to look at the levodopa-induced dyskinesia in Parkinson's disease. And there they found that Delta-9 THCV or specifically THCV was able to delay the, um, the occurrence of the dyskinesia as a side effect in animal models. Um, thanks to the prevalent use of cannabis among people with Parkinson's, there have been some studies with patients that have been asked to self-report the effects. And in Colorado, since medical cannabis had been available for a full five years when they looked into this study, they felt that they had a pretty good population to choose from. Uh, only a small number of participants used cannabis for Parkinson's, but of those that did, they found that 56% saw a benefit in mood, 56% saw a benefit in sleep, and 22% motor symptoms, and 22% quality of life. And of all of the complementary and alternative medicines that have been used by the people in this study, everybody did rate it as the most effective for therapy or sleep or mood improvements among everything. There was also another study done by the Michael J. Fox Foundation where they reached out specifically to people um, online as an on anonymous web-based survey. They also found in this study that it had in significant positive effects on mood, memory, fatigue, and controlling weight gain. And then they did decide that based on this, that further study should be done to look to determine the long-term benefits and also consequences of cannabis use in people with Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis. I also found a very interesting study where 56 doctors were surveyed about their Parkinson's patients and whether or not they actually even had knowledge of how cannabis works. They were able to find that 23% had of some formal education on cannabis. 80% of the responders had patients with Parkinson's disease who used cannabis. And 95% of all of those doctors were asked to prescribe it. Then they looked and 52% took a neutral position on cannabis use, 9% discouraged the use and 39% encouraged it. What I find fascinating is that it is clear from what these doctors did know or believe they knew that cannabis can help with more symptoms than conventional medication can. And yet only 39% encouraged patients who asked. We can also see here that their beliefs about what will improve, which is in blue, were pretty right on with what we know to be true about cannabis. But there's an interesting point here about hallucinations where in red, pretty much everybody believed, well, not everybody, a very large group believed that it would worsen. And I wonder about the no effect group if those are the people who had the formal education with cannabis, because there are the studies that show that cannabis can actually help with Parkinson's induced psychosis. And so many of the medications that they're currently on actually have a side effect of hallucinations. But based on how even the doctors reported, it seems to me that they many of them agree that cannabis could have a positive effect, even though they are not prescribing. And next we will talk about the cannabis strains for Parkinson's disease. Most of these strains are CBD dominant. And for Harley Quinn, it's sativa dominant, 75 to 25%. High levels of CBD, THC 5%, CBD 9%. Medical use treating chronic pain, spasm, nausea, and anxiety. Effect, clear-headed, relaxed, without being too intoxicated. Phenotype, Colombian gold, a Nepali indica, 
and tide and swift land race streams. Aroma, a range of earthy musky to sweet mango. Taste, herb, mango, vanilla, chirpy, mercy. For Regal's gift, a high CBD strain, CBD 14%, CBG 1%, THC 1%. Ratio is 24 to 1, CBD to THC. It's a CBD strong. It's phenotype crossed with Harley, Sue, and ACDC. Medical use for pain, anxiety, depression, stress, and fatigue. Uh, affects cerebral activity, whole body re relaxation, but no intoxication. Earthy taste and terpene myrcene. And the strain dance hall. 60 to 40 sativa dominant hybrid, CBD 13%, THC 1%. Phenotype cross with Juanita La Lagrusima and, and with Kalija. Medical use of chronic pain, depression, inflammation, effects, social uplifting, calming energy. Since uh, Parkinson's disease uh, patients have trouble having energy, so this is a good strain for them. Terpene, myrcene, aroma, earthy, taste, diesel, earthy, pineapple. Intoxicating, but not too overwhelming. For our conclusion, Parkinson's disease is becoming more common in the world. The symptoms of Parkinson's are debilitating and affect the patient's quality of life. Parkinson's disease has many symptoms that cannabis would help with it can alleviate patient's discomfort and help patients manage their disease. The medications that are being prescribed are only treat one symptom of Parkinson's and come with terrible side effects for many people. Many patients find cannabis to be more effective for their symptoms. There are many patients seeking out cannabis as an option. So there is a lot of anecdotal evidence and about specific strains that can help. Once cannabis is federally legalized, there will be a new option for many patients who are not familiar with cannabis. And these are our citations for slides one and seven. Our citation for slides eight and 11. Citations 21 and 23. And try to learn. And that is our presentation. Thank you for listening. And do you have any questions so far? I don't have any questions. I think it was a great presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. We did great. <laughs>